please help me to welcome James Arndt. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Penny. And thank you, everybody, um, for having me up. Uh, Penn, Penn College is quite impressive, and it's very nice to be here. Um, I got on an airplane this morning and flew all over the country and arrived and was shown much grace and much hospitality, so I'd like to thank you all for having me, um, and especially for giving me a deadline. It's, a, it's always nice to have a deadline to work against as an artist, and so when you struggle for hours and hours and hours, kind of by yourself in your one-car garage, surrounded by lawnmowers and things like that, it's always nice to come to a moment like this where I can have uh, a rapt audience and point at artwork and pretend to be impressive, right? This is, this is the, the reward for all those hours and hours and hours in drawing class, right? Drawing one students out, who are out there. This is the payoff. This is where you get to have a little bit of fun, you get to tell people about your ideas, and you get to explain why you do the things that you do. So tonight I'm just going to kind of walk you through the show and talk to you a little bit about how I arrived here. So. Bear with me, it's kind of a long, but not overly complicated story. As Penny mentioned, I began as someone who loved drawing. I was just talking to two little ones out here in the crowd and encouraging them to continue to draw because that's where I started. My first love is drawing, right? It was the thing that my parents figured out that they could give me pencils and keep me quiet. It worked a little too well. <laughs> so, um, as I, as I grew up and left home for school, I, I grew up on a small farm in mid-Michigan near a lot of automotive manufacturing, around people who worked with their hands, around farmers, around automotive workers, um, and I wanted to desperately get away from that. I did not want to grow up and get a union card and punch the clock. I wanted something different. Um, and as soon as I got to art school, all I could draw about, all I could paint about were those people. The, the people that I grew up with, our experiences, um, what my life was like. And I discovered how different my experiences were from the other kids I was going to school with, right? I kind of have this unique viewpoint on life because of the way I grew up, because of, you know, former jobs that I had, things like lead organic remediation specialist. Does anybody know what lead organic remediation specialist amounts to on the farm? Yes, you can make anything sound good on a resume. Um, and so, because of those experiences, I had a unique outlook and um, continued to work. In fact, my ideas, I was talking with a former professor, and she's like, what are you doing now? I'm like, well, I'm kind of doing the same thing I was doing in undergrad. The things I cared about, the people I cared about, the stories I wanted to tell, I've learned to tell in new ways. And what really happened is in graduate school, so after I spent four or five years in undergrad learning to paint, I go to three more years of school to learn how to paint, I give it up. I say, you know, my painting professor always encouraged me to think about my materials as having meaning all on their own, right? The paint means something. The way it's applied means something. It can be fleshy. It can be shiny. It can be opulent, it can be seductive, it can be all these different things. And as I worked with oil paint and I began to think of what is the material communicating, I found some severe limitations, right? Oil paint, it's said, was designed to paint flesh, and primarily the flesh of kings and gods, right? It does it beautifully, it does it better than anything else. Any other type of paint is not as fleshy. It is like the thing it wants to represent. But the people I wanted to work with and the people's stories that I wanted to tell were not like that. They were not kings and gods. And so I had to kept cast around for another type of material. I wanted something um, that was more in line with our experiences. And because of that, I was kind of forced into denim. I didn't choose it. I didn't want to work in it. It's a terrible medium. Do not pick it up. It's hard. It's terrible at representation. Um, but in terms of what it communicates and our knowledge with it, how many of you have a favorite pair of jeans? How many of you wear them out until the crotch blows out? It's the only type of garment we do that with. It's an intimate fabric. 
it's a working class fabric. It's something we all have knowledge of and experience with, so people can anticipate what these things are gonna feel like. And it comes in a wonderful seven step value range. Wrangler blue to acid wash white. Very narrow spectrum. So you get a lot of qualities that are nice about the material. I like what it says all on its own. In fact, a lot of these works would just work as heaping piles of denim. If I was a more conceptual artist, if I was a smarter artist, I would just pile denim in big piles and call it good. I wouldn't put all the work into the, the magic trick that says representation. And that's, uh, but that's something I like. I like representation. I enjoy the magic of making images. I think that's an that's a aspect of artwork that we're all initially drawn to. And I've continuously been drawn to bad representation. And bad representation over good representation has an advantage. Bad representation is like a magic trick, but one that you can see how it works. It's like this. I think up my sleeve. A bad magic trick allows you to see how the trick is done. It doesn't lessen the enjoyment of it. It just makes it visible. This is how pin and top teller operate, right? They do bad magic trick, bad sleight of hand. My representation is bad sleight of hand. These are genes. They're not people at all. They're just genes pushed in different configurations and cut in different shapes to look like people or to simulate people. And the people I choose to represent are family members. They're either blood relation or nearly so. Um, a lot of the people in the room tonight are either close friends or direct blood relation. So I'm just going to go through and I'll point to some pieces and I'll tell you a little bit about why I chose these people and who they are and how they came to be. So um, directly behind me here is my niece Megan with this wonderful label that Penny did for me on her embroidery machine that's really nice. Um, Megan was born premature. Really, really little. I was in fourth grade. She was one pound, 16 ounces, or 14 ounces, just under two pounds. Um, she's now in her mid-20s. She's an independent filmmaker. She lives on the mean streets of Detroit, making documentary films. And so as I think about her, as I think about my relationship with her, she's a far removed location from where I live. We interact very rarely. What could I do for her as an artist? Well. I wanted to protect her. And so I looked at the materials I had at hand and my wife and I spent three days cutting out every single rivet from every single pair of jeans we had so that I could up armor Megan, right? She's tough. That's what I wanted people to know about her. Um, but I also wanted to add some toughness to her. I wanted to kind of send the gift, right, from my far distant removed location. And this way I get to have my family, right? They live in my garage. Even though I'm 16 hours away, I get to like think about them and turn them over, think about their lives, think about my relationship with them, and improve that relationship. On this wall over here uh, is my other niece. This is Ellie. Ellie's 13 and terribly awkward. We're in AVU 13 and terribly awkward. Or serial killers. To be 13 is a terrible age. Were any of you 13? Oh my goodness. 13 is the worst age ever. You suddenly got an almost adult body and none of it works right and you're tall and gangly and you feel like a, you stick out like a sore thumb. And so someone donated a pair of jeans to me that had these wings painted on it and I thought, man, if any 13 year old could use anything, it would be a pair of wings. And so that's what I did for her. So as I make these portraits of them, I'm actually thinking about them a little bit of how I want them to be, how I know them to be, right? Not as they are, but what I want for them. And so I bring that to the work. Um, there's a lot of different stories. Some of them are more interesting than others, but um, just as a non-family example, I'll talk about Catherine Aiken over here. Catherine is a neighbor of ours carried by four children, four children under five. 
And so her, her day-to-day existence is busy, 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 busy. And as a father of three girls myself, I kind of know what that feels like. And so as I'm thinking about her and I'm thinking about what she needs, like what, what can art or what can I represent about her life, I can bring to that the, the fact that she needs to be multiplied. There needs to be more of her. Or there needs to be, you know, a, a period of rest. And, her, and in fact, the way I'm building it, the application of the material, is, is like the thing. She is harried or stressed out, right, is another way of saying that. So is the application of the material. If you get up close on that, you'll see that it's a lot of little bits piled up on top of each other. And so I like that. And I like the way they resolve. I think one of my favorite artists is Vic Munez, who's a Brazilian-American artist and works in garbage and sugar and chocolate and all sorts of different things that are bad at making images. And he talks about watching people watch works of art, and that they do something like this. They get very, very close, like this, and then they lean back like this. And they get very, very close, and then they lean back like this. And he talks about the perceptual shift that happens. And he's, he's actually studying what happens in between people's ears, right? The fact that we enjoy things for what they are, paint or denim in this case, we like that. We like to be able to see it. And we also like the magic trick of representation. And so we oscillate back and forth. And that's a powerful tool that you can use that he points out to us. You can use that over and over again. So the newest work here is behind you. These are my Toltemic figures. These sculptural figures are um, people in my life that I've created. And these are more recent additions. These are uh, Paul Olson and Christine Connery and Logan Woodle. These are people I work with down at Coastal Carolina. And um, they're essentially my new extended family. And so I've adopted them as my own. I get to know them very well. I get to investigate them through artwork. and. Um, and it's fun. They're like growing out of the ground. And so in, in terms of meaning, in, ter in terms of structure, I like to think about our relationship to um, work and working class materials through the people I know and how that has affected their lives. And so a little bit of my autobiographical story feeds into this. I grew up in an automotive town uh, where we used to build every General Motors vehicle in the United States. And since I was a kid, we've lost 80,000 jobs in the automotive industry, just in my town. And so it's, it's, really, it's really changed things for people. And to watch them struggle, and to watch them look for work, and, and to watch them have relationships to work is, is what my work is about. I get to think about our relationship to work. And so a lot of us have experience with jobs, or a lot of us have some experience with work. And in my experience, it's been uh, that not that work is bad, but that certain types of work are better. And so artwork for me is one of those types of work. It's what I call whole and undivided. And the history of work since industrialization is about the division of labor. It's about cutting work up into pieces so that we only ever get to see just a little slice of it. Art's not like that. Art makes you have to engage with work that's whole and undivided. You think it up, you design it, you execute it, you manufacture it, and you come and talk about it. So it's, it's a complete world of work. And that makes work enjoyable. Right? It's not a burden to do that. It's fun. And that's the type of work that I want people to be able to engage in. Um, unfortunately, our, the structure of our society is such that most of us work at little tasks work at little slices of work. We have just a small component of the work placed in front of us. And that's what assembly line work is really like. The people I grew up with uh, worked a lot online. And that means you do just one thing. And you never get to see the finished car. You just put the bumper on, right? And that work is a drudgery. No matter how good it pays, it's not satisfying. And so as I work, through work and think about work with working class materials, that's really what I'm turning over in my head. What do I want to know about people's lives and their relationship to work and how it affects them? 
And the reason I work with family is because I, I'm placing people through image making in vulnerable positions. Hi, Meredith. <laughs> in very vulnerable positions. And so I would only do that with people that I love. Right? Image making is a form of power exercise. Right? When you draw a picture of someone, you're exercising power over that person's image. And that's why we have to be sensitive to those types of things. And working with my family allows me to be insensitive, right? I love my family. My family knows I love them. I can do anything I want with them. And they have to be okay with it. Why? Because they're family. They can't get rid of me. But to do that to other people, to, to walk in other people's stories, is something that artists should be sensitive to. Right? To not trespass on other people's stories. To not exercise powers on populations that you don't have any resonance with. And so that's one, one of the reasons that I work with family. And one of the things that I would wave my finger at other artists and say, don't do that. Don't be tourists in other people's lives. Tell your stories. Right? Those stories are for other people. And so as you walk around tonight and enjoy the work, you can see a lot of different techniques. You can see a big sparkly naked gym back here. Don't look, it's a PG-13. There are children present. <laughs> oh. But if you're going to make people vulnerable, you should make yourself most vulnerable, most open to criticism, and most exposed. And so that's really a, a literal kind of ex exploration of that. And in my transformation, really from a farming, working class kid into now, you know, a rather prestigiously placed college professor type dude who gets to do stuff and travel all over the country and come here and talk to you. You know, this is what the, the lever that art has worked in my life and, and something that it might do for you as well is that it's a powerful tool of transformation. And if you have a vision and a dream, you can use art as a lever to help you position yourself where you need to be. And so, I hope many of you will walk around and enjoy the show. I'll, I'll take a few questions now. I'm talking too long. Professors talk too long. Um, but if you're curious about how they're made or anything like that, shoot. Who's Harper? Harper is, <laughs> Harper is a little devil. Harper is my seven-year-old daughter. Uh, she's three. In that image, Harper's a little girl with the firecracker, the sparkler on the far wall. And she's mine. She is the first of mine. Um, my wife and I have three daughters. Our newest is four weeks old. So I'm operating on limited amounts of sleep right now. Um, but they're all beautiful and they're all kind of uniquely different. I think the, the strangest thing about having children is that even though they come from the same parents, not, none of them are exactly the same. And so Harper is my um, musing on kind of the ephemeral nature of childhood. It just, it, you wish you had a pause button for childhood. Other questions? Where did I learn to talk into the microphone like this? There you the backdrop. The, the backdrop, the listing ships. It can be seen as a metaphor for even my own family. A lot of families like my family. Um, I like listing ships. They're, this is cut from a single bolt of denim fabric that I got from a plant in Georgia. Um, I was actually able to cut four of those out of one bolt that they sent me. And it's a, it's a silhouette image of listing ships. And I always, I think that's a nice metaphor for a lot of people who have been through struggles like this with employment, have lost jobs, have lost family, have suffered through divorce or suicide or all the other effects that these types of um, tragedies that befall communities have, um, but still somehow manage to float. I like that. Bill Cosby taught me to do this. When I was young, I would listen to Bill Cosby records. And as I got older, I would listen to Bill Cosby records backwards, <laughs> listening for Satan. Never heard Satan. <laughs> Any other questions about the work? Who's Mike, and what's that represent to you? 
Uh, Mike's my older brother. Mike's nine years my elder. We shared a room our whole life. Can you imagine? 18, sharing a room with a nine-year-old. How much fun is that? Mike is, Mike's uh, kind of like my darker image, right? Mike uh, stayed on the farm. He um, works in aerial construction. He had two daughters right out of high school. This could have easily been my life, right? Except for a few choices that I made along the way. Um, it's an interesting guy. He's different from me. I call him the great white hunter. You know, he's, he's a, a man's man. But man, does he not have access to his emotions. And so as his daughters grow up, a lot of these girls on the wall are his grown daughters. And as they grow up, he does not know how to let go of them. And so there's a lot, been a lot of battles between him and his daughters over letting go. And so for me, in that, that absence, right, that literal absence of a child in his torso, is him struggling to come to terms with that, you know? And it's not always, it's, it's not always like it's a happy, fun, sunshiny story about the struggles that people go through, but I think those things are real, right? And I like the real. I'm a sincerity junkie. That's why I make them out of really real genes. And they're really real genes all the way through, right? They're really real genes on the back. They hang from really real gene buttonholes. Um, because I like truth. I like Maurice Sendak. Maurice Sendak wrote Where the Wild Things Are. Maurice Sendak passed away, and I thought the best line that anybody said about him was, he never lied to children. He wrote fiction his whole life. He never lied to children. So I think there's power in, if not being factual, in being truthful to your experience. And so that's a powerful tool that you can wield. There was another question over here. Mackenzie is my niece's daughter. So my brother, who's nine years older than me, is a grandfather, right? Um, a young grandfather, and Mackenzie is um, actually his, his second grandchild. And so these things get complicated. Mackenzie is just another character in the drama of the unfolding family members. I have in-laws, I have step-parents. Um, so there isn't a shortage of people to think about and work with. I even have other mothers. I hope a lot of you had the good fortune to have other mothers or other dads, right? These were the people who you showed up at their house after school and you drank their juice boxes and you know they always had Kool-Aid in the fridge, those type of people. They're the ones who saved my life, right? When in a really hard time, as I could have, you know, I could have either ended up in art school or somewhere else. And so these were the people who kept me on the art school side of things, and it's paid off. Right? It's a lot of hard work, it's a lot of lonely hours, but I get to be here and I get to be doing it, and that's a lot of fun. Let's talk about my mom. That's, that's, a, that's the real question. What does your mom think of what you do? <coughs> mom's here. Mom's on the back wall. Mom's in her nightgown without her hair, right? Maybe some of you have moms who don't always have their hair on. Um, she does not like that. But she likes this. You know, and that's the amazing thing is my mom is really proud of the things that I do. Um, and I try to be kind, but her in hair, gussied up to go out with the church ladies, is a fiction. And I wanted a picture of my mom, who more than half the time is asleep in her chair at 9 o'clock at night, <laughs> with her hair not off, but off kilter. Um, and she's a good sport about it, but I love my mom. Let me say that on tape. I love my mom. Did a lot of great things for me. Entered me in my first art contests. Right? That's what moms do. Um, but those relationships are fraught with complication. I'm sure you understand, right? Everybody has a teenager out there understands mothers and fraught relationships. Any other questions? Where do you get your fabric? Good question. Um, a lot of people ask me, like, where do you get your material, right? Um, I ask. I come to things like this, and this is where I solicit. I say, 
pass the hat and I say, do any of you have jeans that don't fit? I'll be here till tomorrow. I'll be happy to put them in my carry-on bag and take them home. I'll show you my UPS address. I have not bought materials in four years. Um, everyone, um, and I really like this part of it. People show up with short stacks of wash jeans and they'll be on my office chair, they'll be outside my door, they'll be in little plastic bags. Everything that you see around you is entirely donated by, by people who wanted to be part of the work. And, and that's really important to me is um, if you're gonna tell people's stories, you know, if Megan is gonna be a model, Megan's jeans should be in the piece. And that's, when, when you think about material, when I touched on materiality and its inherent meaning, when you think of what cotton is, right? Cotton is, work. Cotton is dust and tears in the field. It's the sweat of garment makers. It's the lives of people who wear it out. And then it comes to me. And so it has work embedded in it. And I like that. That's the material working for me versus me trying to make the material do something. Anything else? As you uh, conceive of these projects and pieces uh, in the conception and the, the, the construction, how often do you sketch and what are the preliminary sketches end up doing? My, my first love is drawing. I, I'm a slave to observational drawing, unfortunately. My training is very um, traditional in, in that sense. People who can cartoon, that's another skill that I, I did not hang on to. So imaginative based drawing is, is difficult for me. Um, but observational drawing, figure drawing, things like that is uh, pretty natural for me to do. Now, I, I work from a rule-based creativity area. I used to be a painter. Um, I still consider these paintings to a certain extent, but um, when I sit down and go into my studio, I used to look at paintings and speculate. What is it supposed to be? Would it be better like this? Should it be bigger? You know, all these questions that artists run through their mind. In my studio practice now, what I do is I have a rough sketch, usually on my garage wall. I thought of that, I drew it, and usually I'll have to write a note next to it so that I can remember tomorrow what that was. Some of these ideas are not so good, okay? They get, they get tossed in the dustbin of history, but the ones that make it to the point of where I'm ready to begin follow this rule-based creativity platform. And I have kind of like four rules to help me in the studio. So I always know what I'm supposed to be doing. My rules follow something like this. What's the material? Denim. How big? Life size. Who? Family. And, and so in, within that kind of framework for myself, that rule-based creativity, I can go anywhere I want. I can do anything I want, but I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm in there. And that's, that's something about the discipline of work that's not taught in school, is it? You need to get to work in the studio. And you need to make work in the studio. And you need not to sit and think about, what am I going to make? I know. I know what I'm going to make every time I go in the studio. I got three kids. I got 20 minutes. Does that answer your question, sort of? Yeah. Sort of. Thank you. Anyone else? Shut them up. <laughs> I have color, color in me. Um, man, I had a great senior show, my uh, undergraduate, and uh, I was cock of the walk, you know, confident. I had 20 paintings coming out of undergrad. They were spectacular, they were large. They were what we used to call bips, big important paintings. Um, and I got massacred on color. And they were right. Boy, I didn't want to hear it. Look, at these paintings are awesome. Yeah, they're kind of muddy. There's too much yellow. Um, and working through that, I've discovered the solution, right? Monochromatic. An immediate sense of harmony through an underlying concept of sameness, right? If I introduce denim colors, which might be a possibility further down the road, it has to be integrated. It has to be just like any other painting, right? It has to balance proportionally against the other colors. Denim comes in a variety of different colors. Indigo I like, though. 
Um, not only is it the, the primary pigment that we find in denim, but it also has a, a long historical tie to West African slave labor in South Carolina, where I live currently. So the fact that it's a, a native plant that was grown in colonial days in, in uh, America and is tied to the work of so many people who were brought here against their will seems important. So yeah, colorsome, but yeah, I can see color sometimes. Harmony, 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 harmony. It's an important factor in works of art. <laughs> All right, if there aren't any other questions, I'll say, come on up and talk to me, I'm friendly. Um, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much for having me.